Hey, I get the thing to myself. Good morning. Thank you for coming out during the terroristic threat of the virus. I'm glad you're here. We'll make announcements more about that in a little bit, but we're going to begin the worship service. And if you're capable, would you stand with us as we begin singing today?
isolated mountainside in East Asia, impoverished villagers are learning trades to better provide for their families. As they work, they hear the story of Jesus in their own language. Generations before them struggled as subsistence farmers, living in fear of evil spirits. Alliance workers are here, helping these villagers have a better life and hope in Jesus. Near a dusty plain in Southeast Asia, littered with landmines and remnants of war, a network of home churches is bringing life where death once reigned. People are meeting Jesus. Sisters share with brothers. Neighbors share with neighbors. Former enemies are finding unity in Christ. In this area once considered a wasteland for the gospel, vibrant alliance fellowships are springing up. In a sprawling West African city, a young man once called cursed for his physical deformity and turned away by his family is hearing a different message. Love and acceptance, a family to belong to, a new identity in Jesus. As many of our workers discipled him, his life was transformed. He can't help but do the same for others now. God is opening up new pathways to ministries like these around the world. As a movement of Alliance believers, we follow Jesus' example and commands, loving and helping people in His name. We are serving communities through vocational expertise that impacts the whole person and their society. We are multiplying church networks that create even more churches to serve the unreached in their communities and beyond. And we are developing people who will disciple others to be leaders with a passion for Jesus. From our founding, Alliance people have come together to take the gospel to the neglected places where Christ's name has not been named. Today, more than three billion people still have little to no chance of hearing the good news. But God is forging new pathways to these peoples once out of reach. He is calling us to join Him, to follow Him to regions beyond. Amen. Well, Lord willing, we're going to have our missions festival conference uh, the weekend of Palm Sunday with Jerry and Shelley Crott. These, uh, this is the adult version. There's one with the child's uh, silhouette on there on the back table and also in the entryway. If you want to do a faith promise to support those who are serving in regions beyond, and we encourage you to do that. Our goal again this year is $13,000 uh, toward our Great Commission Fund. And the way that it works is you fill out one of these cards, you put it in the offering plate, and we total up the numbers of how much has been promised by faith, and then that's between you and the Lord, whether or not you fulfill that, and obviously you're trusting God to do that, that's why you put that number in there. And so uh, we encourage you to pick up the faith promise cards as you leave this morning, either on the back table here in the sanctuary or out in the foyer. So the governor today, if you haven't heard yet, just made an announcement that starting this Wednesday, schools are closed. And so if you have children in your home that go to public school, you're gonna to have to figure out what to do with them uh, starting Wednesday. However, the governor also said, when I read it just a few moments ago, that they're trying to make some kind of exceptions for people in, men, uh, in, in the uh, health field as well as emergency responders so that those people aren't trying to figure out what to do with the kids now that I'm trying to be serving in fire department or police department or in the hospitals or whatever. I imagine that's going to unfold in the next couple of days, um, and so be listening to your, your uh, news to find out exactly how that's all going to play out. Obviously, it all has to do with this uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus that is causing the world to... Uh, uh, somewhat what I would consider panic. Um, by the way, this is a special announcement just in uh, this morning. I happened to stop by Super One. They had toilet paper on the shelves just in. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as church is over, you might want to go over there. So I'll just let you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's weird. I mean, we, none of us, I don't think, ever experienced something like this in our lifetimes before to this degree. Um, but here's the thing. The President uh, Trump ha has declared today a National Day of Prayer for this 
situation. So that's what we're going to pray and focus on, okay? So join me in prayer. Lord, I think of that scripture that does say that, God, you don't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, sound mind, or common sense. Heavenly Father, we are in a global pandemic, according to our leaders. People are afraid of this uh, bug because it's pretty... Uh, wicked, I guess, when you get it, and it certainly uh, causes death to people who have extenuating circumstances. Lord, we do pray for those families who have suffered death. Lord, this is not a joke to them. They're grieving the loss of their loved one, and so we pray that your Holy Spirit will bring comfort you will make manifest yourself in their lives, Lord, if they don't know Jesus, that at some form, in some way, they will discover your wonderful peace and salvation. We pray for those individuals who are struggling with the sickness around the world. Um, it's pretty ugly from the sounds of it, so we just pray you'll give them strength and then be able to get through it. Ultimate, Lord, um, I pray that we, we just talked about um, how you can redeem suffering. And all right now, our world is suffering panic and fear, paranoia. They're attacking each other in some cases. And God, you are on the throne. That has never changed. So we who are believers, God, may we please, Father, <clears throat> give us boldness, courage to use yes common sense but Lord to be able to rather than get involved in the winds of panic to speak peace to people to demonstrate the love of God in the most practical fashion to love those father who are in panic and rather than casting stones at them for being in that panic that we pray peace over them and blessing over them God, if at any other time in our world history that we are aware of, this is the opportunity for believers to rise up and say we are not afraid. That we are in the hands of God and if God should desire that we go through this, then we'll go through it. If we die as a result, as a result of it, that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the promotion. So, Lord, let us who are followers of Christ not walk in fear, but rather demonstrate faith. Pray for those who are afraid. Counsel those that who are, Lord, paranoid. Help those, Lord, that maybe they don't have because of this panic. They don't have the right kind of foods or the right kind of materials in their house for their family members. That we would give to them ours and trust you. Lord, I just pray that through all of this that you will at some point allow people to look up, encourage people to look up and know that you are God. So I do pray, Heavenly Father, that you will blow with the wind the same wind, if you will, the same breath of God that created the universe, with that same breath, now you will eradicate this virus and destroy it and remove it, and everybody will recognize because it happened so suddenly that it is God and God alone. Lord, be with our people. Protect them from getting sick at every level. Be with those who are already sick. God, bring healing to their body. Give them strength. And let, thank you, God, that we can meet together and gather together in the name of Jesus Christ and worship you. Be blessed now as we continue to honor you with song and giving of ourselves, our finances, etc. Be glorified, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I was told um, this morning that one of the things the governor said was... Um,
that he's encouraging no more groups than 10. Um, again, he'll have to make that mention when that's supposed to start and all that kind of stuff. But just if you have email, just stick to your emails. If we send out an announcement at church, you'll get it. Um, we're not making an announcement at this point, but we're just letting you know. There are churches today that are closed uh, because they're, they're, they're just acting prudent, trying to control this thing if they can. Um, and if we feel that that's what we need to do, the elders actually are scheduled to meet tomorrow night for a regular meeting. We'll talk about these things. But if you get a, a message from us, it's not that we're panicking, but we're just taking the prudence and honoring the requests that would come to us from the people who are supposed to be in the know. Okay? At this point, we're still planning next week. We're still planning an Easter, celebrating the resurrection. You know what? If we don't meet in church, we're still going to celebrate the resurrection. So we'll just keep going. All right? All right. So let's continue now to worship our Lord together. Ushers, will you come, please, as we sing the song, will you please receive the morning offering?
like no other your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say. But your name is a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelf for life, no other your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say. But your name. Say, just to give you some comfort regarding that virus thing, there are, I think they said now 35 cases in the state of Minnesota. Not one of them were transferred among Minnesotans. They all came in from outside. Um, so that's why we're taking, the governor's taking these extra precautions just to keep people separated for a period of time that that might uh, blow over. I was looking for my bulletin. Oh, there it is. No, yeah, there it is. I wanted to share something that I forgot to share with you. Um, uh, the SDI, that was the assessment that we're going to be taking. I sent the information to the district um, and in the process of putting everything together. But I just wanted you to know there are 32 of our people that are going to be a part of that, which I think is a fabulous representation. Yeah, go ahead. That's great. I know some of you can plot even if you're not doing it. That's, I mean, that's great. I know everybody can't or somebody feels that they probably aren't supposed to, and that's, that's okay, but we have a good representation. Um, right now, again, everything's on schedule according to uh, what we've been planning. We'll just see where that goes as things unfold. Uh, youth, I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of, uh, this is grades um, 6 through 12, at the Chisholm Assembly of God, Youth uh, for Christ is having a thing called Awaken that'll take place uh, the evening of the 27th of March and Saturday the 28th. And again, until you hear differently, plan for these things. And there's other announcements in your bulletin that I hope that you will pay attention to as we move toward not only our missions conference, but also after that, our Easter weekend. All right, so that being said, um, it's so appropriate for us. It was so, I mean, for us to go through this soul care and then we talked to here a few weeks ago about we shouldn't live in fear and all this thing's happening. It's like, yeah, I get, I, I'm again guilt feelings if I, I'm afraid, so I can't be afraid. And we don't need to be, right? God's in control of all things. But we do take precautions and that's why some of these things are happening. As we talk about that not to be afraid, that moves us into what we're going to talk about today. We had started on this last chapter of soul care on the area of deliverance. And you are and I am being challenged, I think, by God to elevate our maturity and understanding of what God has for us and what God wants us to be a part of. So for a few months now, we've been examining the health of our redeemed soul. Hopefully, we've been self-examining as we've been going through this process. There were seven transformational principles for a healthy soul. Again, let me bring those to us just in review. Our identity is in Christ. Old things have passed away, new things have come. If we do not see ourselves as Christ sees us, everything else is going to be skewed. We are in Christ Jesus. Secondly, we need to have a heart of repentance, and that needs to happen when we fail. We must also face and purge family sin patterns that maybe we didn't ask for, but we're part of because we're part of that family. Forgiveness is also a huge command and the key to strong spiritual health. It is a key. Without forgiveness, you will not be able to grow in your faith. Next, we must press into God for healing of those wounds we perceive as unhealable, whether they be uh, wounds of the physical, but also spiritual, emotional, mental kind of wounds. 
Then we claim victory over our fears, recognizing that they indeed can be overcome. We do not need to live in fear. When we surrender to fear, we're surrendering to God's enemy and our enemy. That's where fear comes from. And last week, we began to uncover how to be delivered from demonic influences. I'm going to challenge you a little bit more on this. We were this morning during Sunday school class. Let me make this, class, uh, this announcement again. Next Sunday morning, um, the teen class is going to come down and join us, and the other adult class is welcome to come down and join us. Anybody not a part of the normal Sunday school classes, we'd love to have you do that. But if not, you're still invited to come down to my class next Sunday morning because we're going to be talking about how the enemy is working locally in our own community. And it's going to be some stuff that will surprise you, okay? I mean, surprise you. Um, not to frighten you, that's not the reason, but to get you and I to be on our knees more often and to stand up for what God says we're supposed to be a part of. So um, we're going to return to the two questions we had last week. By the way, that class is at 9.30. Can a Christian be possessed by a demon? The answer is a resounding no. A Christian cannot be possessed by by a demon. Possession as a term of ownership. If a person has given their life to Christ, we are owned by Jesus. We are in Christ Jesus. A demon cannot possess us and push aside the Holy Spirit. Okay? Can't do it. Not strong enough. Yeah, amen. For Christians, ownership has been paid by the blood of Jesus. We are bought with a price. We belong to God. And that is an awesome, awesome feeling. However, can a Christian be oppressed or even demonized? And here the answer is yes. And I want you to stick with me before you walk out of the building. Demonization implies demonic influence. Are we influenced to sin? Absolutely. That doesn't mean you have a demon. But we are influenced to sin. We are tempted to sin. Christians can have varying degrees of demonization, some of which have taken hidden dwelling and will require a deliverance of that demon hiding in the corner of your soul. Now this is where it gets, where I, I got to keep putting these disclaimers out. Please do not go on a witch hunt and start looking around and going, I think I know who has demons. <laughs> okay, this is not what we're doing. But we're, not also, we're also not going to give credit to Satan and say, well, he can't do that. He can't. We just need to be alert to it. What God wants is for everybody not to experience just salvation, but to experience the fullness of his glory. And the enemy doesn't want that to happen. So the enemy is going to use things that either we willfully jumped into or something has been forced upon us as perhaps a means of keeping us bound to that thing, whatever it is. And so we have these moments where all of a sudden it's like, oh, I, I just don't want to live anymore. I'm so discouraged, so depressed. Where's that coming from? It's not coming from God. Now, I do understand in some cases there could be chemical, biologically chemical imbalance that has to be taken care of by, by a, a, a certified physician, okay? But when I was in Duluth, and I heard it again when I lived here, people that worked on the, the fifth floor in our community, people that worked on the floor over there, what they called back in those days the psychiatric ward or the mental health ward, the two different people, two different locations, two different eras of my life, they both said this, 50%, I'm convinced, 50% of the people that are on here are under oppression or possession. That they don't need to be here except the enemy's got them all screwed up. That's alarming. It should be for us. Now for those, and I'll say this, we're going to come back to it again. For those who are demonically possessed, that means they're not believers. And we should never try to do a deliverance ministry with someone that's not a believer, or a non-believer, excuse me, unless they're willing to give their life to Christ first. I'll explain that in a little bit. So let's look at this a little bit. Now they got your, your attention, and I know I do. I can see you burning in my eyes. Okay, Christians have varying degrees. Uh, some have taken hidden dwellings and will require deliverance, and that's what we're going to talk about. So the scripture talks about from glory to glory, okay? Begin with from beauty. 
Genesis 1, and we're going to give you some foundation for what we're talking about. In Genesis 1, verse 31, and then into chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3, God saw all that he made. Okay, we're talking about creation, right? And behold, it was very good. In other words, it was sinless. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day, and thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts, angelic and earthly. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, set it apart, in other words, because it, in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. There is the beauty of God's creation. Somewhere along the line, somewhere in that time period, and I don't know what that time period is, it went from beauty to ashes, at least in the heavenlies. Genesis 2 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, in other words, knowing both good and evil, she took from its fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband, and he ate. And then their eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made lo themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I'm, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Doesn't this sound like a parent with a little child? Did you do that after I told you not to? And the response is like a little child. Ah, oh, the woman you gave me. She gave me from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? Oh, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field, on your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Which was a prophecy, by the way, about Jesus Christ coming to redeem us. To the woman he said, I greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. And then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you should not eat, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles that shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us. Isn't that what the devil said would happen? Eat that fruit, and you'll be like God. God says, become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, the word us here means triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Behold, a man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever in this condition, is what he's saying. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the beginning of the battle of good, if you will, and evil. Now, it's not really a battle. I mean, not for God, because God's a victor every single time. 
But for us, there is that battle, okay? Unfortunately, um, this is how the enemy operates. And so keep this in mind as we're talking about this ministry of deliverance. The enemy operates by giving us half-truths so that we can believe something that isn't true at all. The day you eat of it, you will be like God. He didn't end that with knowing evil. He said, you'll be like God. Wow. Isn't that, the, isn't that the goal of every single living human being on the planet? To have complete control and to be in charge of everything? I will be like God. I'll control my own destiny. It doesn't happen that way. Because the enemy's trying to destroy us God's trying to redeem us. There is no middle ground of just leave me alone, I'll do my own thing. There is no your own thing. You're either committed to God or you're committed to the enemy. And if you're in the middle, you're committed to the enemy, you just don't realize it. So here we have this disaster in the Garden of Eden where God creates this beautiful thing and then humanity messes it all up and we've been living under the curse ever since and the enemy has been still lying to us ever since trying to still get us to disobey and rebel against God at every level even after we come to repentance and redemption in Christ. The problem is we have now, because of all this curse in the world, a, instead of a biblical worldview, a earthly worldview. We look at things through our filter rather than God's filter, the way he d originally designed it to happen. So we need to restore a biblical worldview. Look in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 31 and through 7. Jesus is now comes into the temple. He's in his hometown, okay? He comes to the temple. They know him as the carpenter's son. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. He's not the son of God, according to the people in the temple. Jesus walks in, and it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He opens up and preaches from Isaiah. And he opens the book, and he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. Okay? So he proclaims who he is in reality, not who they think he is. Then he takes that and begins the ministry of what he just said he was called to do. He goes down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee. He's teaching them on the Sabbath. They were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. So he's in church, if you will. A man's there who has a demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. So in this man was more than one demon. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Keep reading. This gets really bizarre. Because the people who should embrace him as the Holy One of God reject him and the one who wants to reject him is proclaiming you really are the holy one of god and so they tell him leave us alone but jesus rebukes him saying be quiet and come out of him and when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people he came out of him without doing him any harm and amazement came upon everyone and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits to come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. You talk about waking and shaking people up. Jesus just did it. Why was it so astounding? Because it was so unusual. 
with a word. Not with a struggle, not with yelling, not with chanting or dancing, just with a word. Jesus says, be quiet and come out of him. And this guy's thrown to the ground and stands up delivered. And they all know he's delivered. And they're going, wow. This is incredible. Who is this guy? Because we thought he was just Joseph and Mary's boy. Jesus, at this point, has proclaimed his deity and his purpose. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's reading Isaiah's prophecy. He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I am here to do just that. That's what he proclaimed in, in that moment in verse 18 and 19. His deity and his purpose. And then Jesus cast out demons from a God worshiper. Why was the guy in the temple? He was there to worship God. He was either Hebrew or he was a Gentile that was proselytized to be a Jew. He is there to worship God. But instead of having the freedom to worship God, he is acting out what the demons are doing in him. And Jesus also tells us to test the spirits. Now I'm jumping that to 1 John 4, 1 because the biblical worldview, the biblical worldview is that we are, yes, in a world, horizontally speaking, we're in this earthly world, this physical world, but we have been bought with a price. We also are in the world of the supernatural. The problem is we, not problem, but the thing is we can't see what's going on, but we can hear from God what we need to be about. And so when someone is in an environment, a church environment, Jesus tells us to test the spirits. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. In other words, don't just buy in because you're in a worship service. Everything someone does is absolutely of God. That's what he's saying. Test them to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone into the world. This letter is written to the church about what happens inside the church. This is why pastors and, and leaders of the church want to be careful about who they bring into the sanctuary to start, quote-unquote, preaching. You want to know that the person that is, that is in that pulpit is actually a servant of the living God. And it's my understanding, and I wasn't here at the time that I know of, but it was my understanding that there was one point where someone came in, he was very charismatic in terms of his personality, but some of the things that he said were very disturbing to the congregation at that time. Every church has probably had that at least once. We want to be testing what people are saying before we ever allow them to begin teaching or preaching to believers or non-believers for that much, because supposedly they represent God. We are called to work out our salvation. So it doesn't mean we work for our salvation. We don't have to work for it. Jesus provided it free. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to work for that. We have to surrender to it. We have to repent of our sins and ask Christ to forgive us of those sins. But then it is freely given to us and we are freely adopted into the family of God. That we don't work for. Jesus did the work on the cross. But once we come to faith in Christ, we do have to work at growing and maturing in that new relationship with God. That doesn't just grow naturally. Apostle Paul says that, that when you're little, you feed on the milk. And then he, and then he rebukes the, the church because he said, some of you have been on milk for decades. How many children would survive if when they're 3, 6, 10, 15, 20, they're still just drinking milk? 
That's the imagery he's trying to give to the church. You've got to grow in your faith. We all do if we're followers of Christ. So we're called to work out our salvation. It's Philippians 2.12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my present only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Understand, this is a very important thing. This is a very serious thing. At salvation, our sins are forgiven, removed, and we're made perfect in Christ. However, we still struggle with sin. We know that. We are now returning from the worldly curse culture back to the kingdom of God culture. Our salvation is secure in an instant. Our sanctification takes one longer than a lifetime, one day longer than a lifetime to actually completely perfect. So this is where it begins. This is where the separation of, of uh, our, our holiness got damaged by sin. And Christ says you can come back to redemption and salvation. But there's also the evil is at work in the world. And so we have to be prepared. Can Christians be oppressed or demonized, not possessed? Yes, they can. Christians, as a matter of fact, are called to a restoration ministry. It began with the 12 disciples. In Matthew 10, verse 1, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And you might be sitting here going, I hope not because I hope you know your Bible better than that. But you might be saying, oh man, that'd be so cool to have that. Well, guess what? He gave it to us too. It continues with all his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority, Jesus says, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. The implication is, and I'm giving it to you. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe that all I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What did Jesus say his ministry was? What did we read at the beginning when he read from the book of Isaiah? He said, here's my ministry. He said, good news is that I have been called to speak deliverance, to set the captives free, to heal those that are sick, and blind, and paralyzed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of the sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed, demonized, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then He says, all my authority now I'm given to you. Go and do the same. Do you honestly see yourself as someone that can do that? I hope so. Because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we, we are the ones that are supposed to go. Later on in the book of Acts, it says that all, all, if all the uh, power of the Holy Spirit came down upon us and we received the power to be His witnesses in Jerusalem, our local town, Judea, our surrounding area, Samaria, among those people that are outcasts in the world and the uttermost parts of the earth. God's plan, although for me I'd say, okay, you're God, so I'm not going to question it, but it seems like a really bad plan, is to use broken vessels to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But he does. He says, you and I are his witnesses. You and I carry the very power of God to everyone we meet. Not just the story of God, not just the message of God, the power of God. And we have the authority of Jesus Christ to go into the darkest corners and be able to preach and to teach and to deliver and to minister and to pray for healing. 
Do you see yourself as that kind of person? Because that's who you are. That's who I am. Because of Christ who's in me. The enemy has done this terrific job of convincing us, well, that's why we have missionaries and pastors. God delivered all people so that they might help in the, mes- in the mission of delivering others. And there are people in our society that are waiting for the touch of God, and God said, you, who are believers, and me, you're my voice, you're my love, you're my expression of physical presence. And if we're not going to do it, who is? Because the devil won't. The world won't. The kingdom of God is the reversal of everything that went wrong when sin entered the world. It is the restoration of everything back to the way God intended it to be. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We are working toward that end game. One day Jesus is going to come again and he's going to rapture the church and then he's going to establish the new heaven and the new earth after the thousand year reign. One day it will be back the way he originally designed it to be. But until then, he says, go into all the world and be my witness. Use my authority, use my power, help redeem people from their sins by giving them the good news. And then if they're struggling with the demonization and the enemy's still trying to hold them back, then you pray deliverance over them because you have the power to do it in Christ. Broken relationships, sickness, death, spiritual bondage, demonization, poverty, oppressions were not part of God's creation. That was the effect of the fall, the rebellion. Jesus did deliverance. Making disciples involves the work of Jesus. And we ought to do the things Jesus did. And we ought to try it if we've never done it, believing God at his word. I'm going to ask a question. Please don't raise your hand. Don't even nod. Don't even look at me at this point. I won't even look at you. I'll just ask the question. Have you ever led one person to salvation? Because that's the call of the church. Have you ever stepped out and tried to lead someone from death to life? Because that's the call of the church. Have you ever tried to pray over someone when they're sick to see them delivered from sickness? Have you ever tried to pray over someone that you recognize the Spirit's got hold of them in one form or another? They are a follower of Christ, but they're being held back by this evil. And pray that cast out. Because that's the call of the church. Make disciples. Save the lost. Cast out demons. Heal the sick. Set the captives free. That's the true work of the church. And it doesn't take a scientist to figure out the church isn't doing its job. At least not in the U.S. And people are suffering as a result of it. We can't be responsible for the entire church, but you know what? We can be responsible for us. Last week, I asked you to fast, or begin a fast. I thought mine was pretty easy. (laughs) You get hungry between 10 and 3. Some of you have fasted uh, things like, like, like material things. Some of you are fasting certain foods or foods in general. If you haven't started it yet, I'd encourage you to continue to do so. The reason is that there's some significance between prayer and then adding fasting where we enter into a deeper and more intense relationship with God. I, I don't know what it is, but God calls it that we give up stuff of our, that we just naturally want or like or do or, or that sustains us so that we can focus more intently on God and God brings out in us this greater awareness of his presence and ability so I'm asking if you haven't yet that you, that you would, if you are already doing some form of fast, then continue it and fast until March 30th, which is the day after this series ends. 
and then pray also during that, pro that time period, five those moments, because when you fast, when you say to yourself, you know what, I hear you, God, I hear what you're saying, I need, to get, I need to get more into the game, I need to elevate my relationship with you, I need to be on the front lines rather than standing back in, in the supply line, the enemy is going to come after you. He's going to try to interfere and stop us. We read last week, right, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, but they will try to countermeasure. So pray. Our enemy will counterattack. Spend time alone with God in prayer. Are you putting on the full armor? That's what we talked about last week, right? Put on the full armor of God. Go to Ephesians 6 if you have to and pray through every element. But daily put on the full armor of God. Be, have a preparation for ministry. Ask God for opportunity. Here's where it gets scary. Ask God to give you the opportunity for ministry. Bring in my path someone that you want me to pray over or to share my faith with. Or both. You ask God that, I guarantee you he will give you that. But then we have to be prepared to respond. Ask for an opportunity for deliverance ministry is coming. So we started this whole thing. I'm laying the groundwork for this, okay? We're, we're starting this whole thing about, well, can a Christian be demonized, o oppressed? I said, yes. So what does all this have to do with it? Because some people in this congregation, it is possible the enemy has hidden in the recess of your soul to keep you in bondage to something that you just don't understand why it keeps coming back. We're going to talk more about that next week. Some of those things may be something that happened to you. Someone else inflicted this on you. You didn't do it. Or you chose to do this in your past. And you just didn't think anything of it. Is the enemy hiding in the pocket of your soul? Are you ready to take ground for Jesus? I shared this morning during Sunday school downstairs. This, and I'll just share it in closing before this last statement. When I was... Um, in my preteens, 10, 10 years old, something like that. I went over to a friend's house and we went in his basement. It's dark and he had a Ouija board. If you're not familiar with what that is, that's a board that's supposed to be able to predict your future if you ask it questions. If you ask it yes or no questions, you put your finger on this little triangle thing and it slides to either yes or no based upon the whatever giving you the answer. Of course, it's evil, it's what it is. It's the enemy trying to trap you into the demonic world. I didn't know that. And then if you don't ask it yes or no questions, it has numbers and has letters on the board and it's supposed to spell out the answer. Well, I thought this was a bunch of hocus pocus, which actually it probably was. <laughs> because I would ask it a question, my friend said, okay, you put your finger on this thing and it's supposed to glide to the answer, so we'd ask it yes or no answers or questions. And uh, when he did it, it was like, you're just, you're just pushing it over there. And then when I did it, it went to the right answers. And I'm thinking, oh, it must be psychology or something. Years later, as I'm praying and asking God, Lord, I want to be fully devoted to you. I want to, I want to purge anything that I was a part of in my life that I shouldn't have been a part of. If there's anything, reveal this to me. He brought that experience back to me. Because that is a gateway to the enemy's camp. Things like this and astrology, or excuse me, uh, yeah, astrology, Witchcraft. There are certain movies, certain books that can do this. That's part of what we're going to talk about next Sunday, uh, especially down in the Sunday school class. We might do it in innocence and in ignorance. The enemy doesn't care. All he wants is an opportunity. And then he might enter into that individual and hide in the recesses of your soul and you keep have this craving to do this thing over and over and over again, or you have uh, ideas of suicide out of the blue for no reason at all, or you have depression times that come and they just overwhelm you and you're down for days. These things, yes, potentially could be chemical imbalance, but a lot of times the enemy's trying to make us believe all of it is so that he can keep people in bondage. And so next week and then the following week, we're going to have a communion service. You need to be praying. If you're coming to these services especially, you need to be praying because God may 
may elevate something that is hidden in you, the enemies has used against you, and now he wants you set free. Or he may want to take you to pray for someone that is going through something and use you to help bring deliverance so that you and I can experience the fullness of God's glory without these scars in our suitcase of our soul. Gives you something to think about, doesn't it? That's why I use a lot of scripture, because if I just told you this, it'd be, so what? But when God says it, we need to pay attention. So I'm going to invite the uh, worship team to come forward as we close in this song. I invite you to join us in Sunday school next morning, 930, uh, for those in that category of teens or adults. And of course, be back next week for our worship service, providing the government doesn't close us down. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, when you knock on the door of the enemy, he will answer. And we are pounding with the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. So I pray, Lord, and we don't want to do this foolishly. So I pray for divine protection, a hedge of protection over all of us and over this congregation over this facility even. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we won't go into this with fear and trembling, but rather we'll go into it with our, our awareness that we have Jesus in us, the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. There we are walking testament to the goodness and the power of God. Let us be bold and this week when the enemy tries to either cast doubt or put up an argument or, or give us fear that we stand on the word of God and say, I will not surrender to the enemy, but I will stand for Jesus. And use us, Lord, however you desire. Let us be ready at the, your beck and call to serve you by serving others especially in this arena we're talking about in deliverance, because it's new to so many. Let us just listen to your voice and respond in boldness and let you do all the work that needs to be done as we just follow your lead. God, you offer us amazing grace, and it's with that grace now we are praying you will use us to see the captives set free. The chains are broken. Hallelujah. Lord. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our final song together, please? And
Hallelujah. To seal this, all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Go in God's peace. Do elbow bumps this morning to keep that virus at bay. Have a blessed day.